Okay, welcome everyone. A few housekeeping notes before we start. Please have your camera off and the mics muted. There will be a Q&A and a comment session after the talk. Feel free to post questions in the chat box directly to me. Also, this event will be recorded and posted online. Good morning. Today, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Richard Muller and Dr. Earhart Steffens, authors of The Hermes Experiment, A Personal Story. Dr. Muller has been a professor in the MIT Department of Physics since 1988. His research focuses on understanding nucleon and the nuclear structure using the lepton probe. Dr. Stephens is a professor of physics at the University of Erlangen, Nuremberg. He worked at the MPIK Heidelberg on spin polarized beams and the targets and continues to serve various roles in high energy physics projects such as Hermes and LHC spin. And then now I would like to hand it over to Dr. Muller and Dr. Stephens. So good morning from Boston. Uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, it's really great to see such uh, familiar faces and friends and everybody looks uh, great and hasn't aged a day. So it's, it's wonderful. So uh, to start with, it must be said that this is a different kind of book. Uh, we teach and we learn physics as a very logical subject, but that is not how research at the frontier gets figured out. Uh, it's messy, it often doesn't follow a linear path, and of course there are people involved. For the personal story of, of participation of Earhart and myself in the Hermes experiment forms the central narrative of the book. By telling a human story, uh, we intended to attract a broader readership beyond physics. Our book is written without any mathematical equations or symbols, mainly to share with the curious reader who doesn't have uh, technical background, how a large experiment like Hermes comes about. We have two introductory chapters that explain the current understanding by physicists of the laws and structure of the subatomic world. And we also have appendices that explain scientific notation, as well as commonly used acronyms. However, we also expect the readership to include interested physicists, uh, particularly those who worked on the experiment, of course, or related research. We have made a particular effort uh, to identify the main contributors over several decades, uh, in, in particular, the large number of young physicists who worked on the experiment and are, are now leaders in physics, academia, research industry around the world. So let me spend a minute introducing the structure of matter. Um, this is the stuff around us here on the earth at night. Uh, it's the solar system, the Milky Way, galaxy, the universe at large. And this is described in chapters one and two in the book. Uh, it all began with the Greeks who guessed about 400 BC that matter was built from indivisible small particles, atomos, which is the basis for the English word atom. But for about 2000 years, human understanding did not really advance very much. Uh, in the early 1800s, chemists developed the atomic theory of chemical reactions, which built on earlier laws describing the behavior of gases as a function of temperature and pressure. By the end of the 19th century, the periodic table of the elements was discovered. Uh, it was established and then the electron, which is point like and has negative charge was discovered. In 1911, Rutherford and his colleagues at Manchester, England, discovered the nucleus of the atom. And shortly after that, the proton, this positively charged nucleus of the hydrogen atom, was identified. Subsequently, in the 1920s, basically 100 years ago, the laws that describe the atom and the subatomic world were developed in Europe, and this gave birth to quantum mechanics. In our book, the key originators and the famous experiment are described in some detail. And we're particularly proud of some of the interesting photos that we were able to um, collect and are rarely seen. And I should say that the electronic book version is both cheaper, but also has much more color photos than the printed copy for those who are interested. 
Okay, back to the Hermes story. In 1925, two young graduate students, George Ullenbeck and Samuel Goudsmith at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands, proposed that electrons carry an intrinsic angular momentum called spin. As the name applies, it's like each electron is spinning around an axis, always with the same velocity. Now, the idea was initially met with strong skepticism by more senior physicists, but Paul Ehrenfest, who was their advisor, being a good advisor, he submitted the paper without telling them. And he said, oh, you're young enough uh, to make a mistake. Well, they didn't make a mistake. It was actually one of the most profound um, insights in 20th century science, really. Uh, we now know the proton also has spin. And most importantly and differently from the electron, the proton is not a point, but it is an extended but tiny object at the center of the atom. In appendix A of our book, we discuss this. We now believe the proton is built from what are called quarks and gluons moving at speeds close to the speed of light. The quarks interact by exchanging gluons and both of them have a new quantum number called color, which you can think of as red, blue, green, like in, in, in color as we use it in everyday life. The quantum theory of color is called quantum chromodynamics, uh, QCD for short. In the late 1980s, uh, there were unexpected results from the CERN laboratory in Geneva, Switzerland, that indicated that we did not understand the origin of the proton spin. Hermes was an innovative experiment that was motivated by these unexpected CERN results that, that used the circulating electron beam in the HERA accelerator to scatter from polarized internal gas targets. These novel targets had been under development by Earhart, uh, myself, and obviously others, uh, many others for other experiments, but were quickly adapted for use uh, in HERA with Hermes. So the proton spin must originate from the spins of the quarks and gluons and their relative orbital angular momentum. And scattering these polarized electrons from the polarized neutrons and protons allows the experimentalists to take snapshots of the quarks as they move in, in the proton. The Hermes detector was designed to include the detection of other final state particles in addition to the scattered electron. In 1988, when Hermes was first conceived, the proton was typically portrayed as a round billiard ball where the structure was dominated by slowly moving quarks. By the time Hermes was completed in 2007, there really had been a revolution in the way the proton was viewed. And we now view it, as, view it as a highly relativistic system of bound interacting quarks and gluons. And scientifically, Hermes had opened up new avenues of research by detecting other particles in coincidence with the scat scattered electron. Today, uh, 14 years later, there's an exciting new multi-billion dollar facility called the Electron Ion Collider being planned to continue the work of Hermes. Uh, it will be built at Brookhaven National Laboratory on Long Island in New York and is expected to begin operation in the early 2030s. It certainly builds on the pioneer remark of Hermes, other experiments, and of course, theory. So personally, I think of this new machine as, as Hermes at higher energy, but realized in a way where the complete final state of the smashed proton or a nucleus uh, can be measured. So now I'd like to, uh, to pass it along to Earhart uh, to make some comments. Thank you very much. Good afternoon from Erlangen, Germany, and welcome also from my side. After Richard's uh, introduction to the book, I want to expand on a few aspects of our story regarding accelerators and spin tools. In 1967, quarks invented by theoreticians to explain the particle zoo were discovered experimentally at Slack in deep inelastic scattering of electrons on hydrogen. Uh, that means on protons. 20 years later, studies at SLAC and CERN using polarized beams and targets indicated a surprisingly low contribution of quarks to the proton spin. And this uh, was called the spin crisis as uh, po pointed out by Klaus Ried. Uh, Another round of experiments was required to understand this unexpected result. Uh, 
Meanwhile, new tools were proposed and studied. One was predicted by Russian theorists from Novosibirsk. A stored beam of relativistic electron, electrons in a storage ring should slowly become polarized. By some reason, I cannot see me on the screen. Okay, it doesn't matter. I hope it works. Um, this uh, effect, self-polarization, was verified around 1970 at Orsay, Paris, and Novosibirsk. In 1984, at, DESI, uh, at the DESI laboratory in Hamburg, the construction of the Hera Collider began, a double ring for collisions of 920 GV protons and 30 GV electrons. The electron ring was designed for self-polarized electrons with space for spin rotators, quite long objects, so you cannot, you have to uh, really uh, plan them during the beginning. At that time, experience with self-polarized beams was limited to GV, uh, three GV machines. Therefore, it was a really uh, courageous decision, supposing that the method will work also at a 10 times higher energy. Other tools were spin polarized gas targets capable of running in a storage ring. These targets could be combined with polarized electrons circulating in a ring, for instance, the Hera electron ring. And this is exactly the concept of the Hermes experiment. Of course, the principles only of these tools were known. Now the focus was on implementing and testing them, uh, which took place during the period 85 to 95. After formation of the Hermes collaboration in 88 with Mil Milner and Reed as co-spokespersons and submission of the proposal to DESI in January 90, the developed and meant and design of all items commenced with high speed. One task of the lab assisted by Hermes was to add a laser based, be, uh, laser based beam polarimeter and tu to tune the electron ring for polarization. By the end of 91, 8% polarization were seen by the transverse polarimeter in the West Hall. In 92, the collider uh, operation with experiments H1 and SUS started. In summer of that year, over 50% electron polarization was achieved and Hermes approved, subject to funding, seven years after the formation of the collaboration in 88 only. On the target, work began in 84 with Milner at Caltech on a polarized helium-3 gas target based on optical pumping for electron scattering experiments. This target with two protons anti-parallel uh, in spin represents in good approximation a polarized neutron. Optical pumping using infrared lasers is very effective and large fluxes of polarized helium-3 gas can be produced. To date, efficient direct optical pumping of atomic hydrogen is not possible due to the lack of intense ultraviolet lasers. The hydrogen target developed at Heidelberg by the Filtex collaboration starting in 1985 was an atomic beam source based on spin-dependent focusing by sextopone magnets or the so-called stern gerlach magnets. Both targets, hydrogen and uh, helium-3, injected their polarized atoms into a 40 centimeter long cold tube on axis of the 30 GV beam. This so-called storage cell serves to boost the aerial density by compression. During 93 to 95, the detector was built and installed in the Hera East Hall and rolled into beam position on February 95. The first year saw a successful run with longitudinal polarized helium-3 gas target. 
The fact that Hermes could run parallel to the collider enabled more than 10 years of successful Hermes running, which took place in various detector and target configurations. 96, 97 longitudinal hydrogen target, 98 to 2000 longitudinal deuterium target, 2003 to 2005 transverse hydrogen target, and the last two years uh, devoted to the recoil detector, resulting in a rich scientific output. About 100 Hermes papers on scientific results, a huge number of thesis works, and more, many more papers on special subjects were published, which is still ongoing. Many young people started their career, uh, which is with Hermes and moved later to other projects. In close contact with theoreticians, a new picture of the nuclear development. As legacy of Hermes, several new projects can be quoted. The most advanced, as mentioned by Richard, the electron ion collider at Brookhaven, the future key project in spin physics. Another spin off is LHC spin. A study of former Hermes scientists, including myself, to install and run a Hermes-like target in the 7TV beam of the LHC, upstream of the LHCB detector. We close our book by saying, in this book, we tried to capture some of the magic of Hermes, a feeling which is certainly present among those of us who have worked together on that experiment in the Hera East Hall and which might inspire future generations in an unknown territory, uh, searching in an unknown territory. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't understand the screen. Yeah, so I think that we were going to, uh, we have uh, participants that will make some comments uh, we'd like to invite. I think we'd start with Dr. Zhang Dong Ji, and then we were going to uh, the, ask the Hermes spokespeople who uh, I think Yo is on, Ed Kinney, I see Dirk Reichbusch, uh, invite you to make some comments uh, first and then move on from there, please. So Zhang Dong. Well, thank you, Richard. Um, invite me to make some remark and congratulations, uh, Richard and Erhard, uh, making this, uh, wrote this very nice book. And uh, in fact, I'm one of the first readers of the book. As soon as available, I got a copy and uh, I read it through without putting it down and uh, was very, um, happy to see this uh, very nice story about uh, Hermes. And um, I think, you know, even though the Hermes has been finished, I think there is an important legacy in, the, in, in this experiment. And, um, you know, um, certainly has great scientific output and also trend a, a great generation of uh, physicists working on uh, electron scattering. And, you know, we uh, nuclear physicists don't usually write book like this. So this is, I think this is really, really good example to, you know, doing the great experiment. And certainly this is one of the great experiment in nuclear physics and to tell the young people that how an experiment can be, you know, motivated and conceived you know, get people and get technology, get money and to get, you know, to work on it. I think it not only it's good for uh, for people who are familiar with the project and to, you know, reminiscent to what, what has been going on and why we do it, but also it's great for graduate students. I think not only for, you know, experimental students to understand how to carry out, perceive an important experiment, um, and also for theory students understand, you know, how much effort is behind those data points. And I often tell my graduate student, you know, 
don't take this that points you know too lightly and call each data points worth so much money in there you know you can calculate in fact and um so in particular you know myself have been uh working on the dark matter experiment for 10 years so when i read through this you know i just feel you know the kind of resonance that how can you you know get an experiment through and certainly it's a great education for um, for our students and i really want to see more books and, like this um, in our fields uh, i'd like to make a couple of personal comments um first of all uh richard and i uh, both were at caltech and, and mit in fact i was a postdoc at caltech and Richard was also a postdoc, well, first as a student and then postdoc. And um, I, I, I'm very happy to see you know, those personal stories in there. And, uh, you know, I would write uh, myself, you know, it's in the book there, and when I read it, I feel very happy. Particularly, I feel, you know, uh, this great environment when, at, at KLOG and, you uh, I have never seen anywhere else, you know, when you have a seminar and, you know, you brought the great cake, uh, case of beer and everybody's drinking alcohol <laughs> and then start to have animated discussions. And very often you have a, you know, speaker with a, with a bottle of beer in hand and then start to uh, give a talk. So um, I, I really appreciate Richard read out a lot of these, uh, you know, very interesting anecdotes about, uh, you know, the personal stories. And uh, of course, you know, also at MIT, we had a lot of discussions about spin physics. Um, so I think this, you know, this not only shows the physicists, you know, their quest after, you know, important physics questions, but also they're human beings and uh, they like to have fun and, uh, so I think, you know, physics is not only fun, but also, you know, and also the life as a physicist is also fun. Uh, the second point I want to make is that, um, you know, I also, my career, in fact, um, grew up with spin physics. And um, you know, when the EMC experiment came out, I was a postdoc at Caltech. And we didn't talk much uh, at Caltech. And, and However, um, you know, when I moved to MIT, I started working on the spin physics, and certainly it was, um, you know, great motivation for me to um, uh, independently discover the GPD, and also um, um, I found the DVCS process in, in 1996, and um, it's very satisfying to see that uh, the Hermes produced the first, one of the first. The DVCS result and and published in 2001, and this paper has an important influence on the uh, future, the DVCS field, and it has, you know, hundreds of citations. And um, as a theorist, it's nothing more gratifying to see you have an idea, and a few years later you see data, and um, it, it's extremely gratifying for that. And um, so I really, really th thank you guys. Um, I'm sure a lot of people working on this in the Hermes collaboration. And thank you guys devoted a small section on the DVCS experiment. Um, I think this is a really, really nice book. I recommend to you know all my graduate students or, and to read and to understand the um, the, um, you know, how physics works and um, how to carry out a great experiment. And, uh, and so again, congratulations, Richard and Erhard. Thank you very much, Ang Dong, for the kind remarks. Uh, so I would like now to call on uh, Dr. Jo Vandenbrand, who was the Hermes spokesman when the uh, experiment was, was installed and commissioned. Please, Joe. Yeah, thanks, uh, Richard and uh, Erach. So, uh, first of all, uh, congratulations. I think this is an excellent idea what you did here. And uh, I think it was an exciting, uh, exciting time. 
Uh, first of all, of course, many of us were much uh, younger uh, <laughs> at that point than we are right now. Um, but also, I think uh, many of us came from nuclear physics and went to a particle physics lab to start doing this experiment. It was at the time when we were, we were at NICAF and we were integrating the nuclear physics and the particle physics groups. So this was so the, the first big experiment going in that uh, direction. What I liked, especially about Hermes, is was that it was very innovative. And uh, all the things with these ultra pure targets, no um, walls on the targets, and only looking at the ideal of, uh, of, of doing a, an experiment where you put a beam on a target. I think that was, uh, was great. I learned a lot in that time. I learned a lot uh, in, the, in the science. Um, but also on the instrumentation. And since then, I moved into uh, first B physics. And uh, now I'm working on uh, gravitational wave physics. But still, many of the things I learned in Hermes with uh, lasers, etc., I'm still using today. Uh, but I also learned a lot about, um, 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 for me personally, how to be in such big experiments and to how to deal with groups and, and to make this collectively uh, happening. Um, I think it's great to see many of the people that were there in the beginning. Um, as I see uh, uh, like uh, Jim Kelsey, uh, Ernie Ilov, uh, Dmitry Topikov, and we did these kind of experiments at Nikev. I see Mos Moscow and Marian, uh, Ricardo Alacon, Wolfram Kosh. So all the people that were there in the beginning. I actually moved um, in the middle of the uh, 90s after the startup. I moved into uh, particle physics, so I, I was not visible in, uh, in Hermes anymore. So uh, let me finish by saying that I have uh, very good memories of this experiment. I really enjoyed it. And of course, also the stories about um, um, having these social events, I remember them uh, very well, but I will not go into that right now. And um, so warm memories, and thank you all for, uh, for doing this. Okay. Thanks, y'all. Very nice comments. Uh, Ed, Ed Kinney, please. Hi, Richard and Erhard. Congratulations on this great book. This is this is fantastic. Not only as a book, but also uh, your goal of uh, instructing the young people just how these things happen, because I know they're they're often come into them at a stage where things are more or less done, and they don't see just the things happen. One, one thing I wanted to bring out uh, was that even though this was by far not the first large acceptance experiment, I remember at the time that it was most of the community that was involved were all using the kind of spectrometer systems. And we were all like, okay, it's a big open geometry thing, even though it's fixed target. And I remember lots of debates at scientific meetings about doing a high precision experiment, say at Slack. Uh, but then you didn't get all these other different particles. And I, I think history has shown that our instinct that measuring the entire final state as much as we could would lead to um, all kinds of new things. And uh, I think the fruit uh, that, that came out of that was just fantastic. It's spawned a whole uh, series of experiments around the world to study things. So. Uh, I just want to emphasize to, to young people, especially that that jumping in where you don't really know necessarily everything you're doing is, is a fantastic way to have a, a great career. You don't want to just stick to the thing that you know how to do and, and not expand your horizons. Um, it's really great to see all the names here and, and all the people. I think even though it scientifically is probably the crowning part of my career, I, I know in terms of the collaboration and the people working with that was, even if I had just been sweeping the hall in Daisy, that would have been worth it. Uh, <laughs> it was it was just fantastic to work with people from all around the world. Uh, the going out uh, the Thursday night parties and all that kind of stuff was just it was just fantastic. It really was uh, the best part of my life. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ed. Uh, I call on, I see Dirk Reichbusch, spokesman of Hermes. Dirk, would you like to have some comments? Yes, uh, congratulations, uh, Erhard and Richard. Uh, I 
remember that back in the old Hermes days, we always talked about, well, we should write this up in a book. Uh, Hermes, uh, the Hermes story will make a great book. And I'm just so happy that you two took the effort and uh, the challenge to write it down in a book. And it's all that we uh, dreamed of. And it's more than that. It really cap uh, captures the the spirit of uh, what we had in Hermes. Uh, for, for me, coming to Hermes, I came from small scale nuclear physics experiments, like a lot of us. And then this was the real, uh, the first time that we really went for a larger collaboration. And uh, I've never seen this experience of uh, the larger world coming uh, in. Uh, I've never repeated that in my life. And you really showed this in the book, uh, how this uh, happened in Hermes and uh, how this bunch of irresponsible nuclear physicists came together and made a great experiment. Uh, it, as Ed just said, it was the highlight of my scientific uh, life. And I'm just so glad to have been part of uh, Hermes and uh, your book, really brings it all back to life again. Hermes was more than just experiments, and more than just publications. It's, uh, whenever I meet uh, the old Hermes people at, at CERN, or uh, even now with the Einstein telescope, uh, where a couple of old Hermesians uh, are present, it's always the old Hermes gang that we uh, find. Uh, and this spirit, uh, you, you show it in the book, and I'm so happy that I uh, can now show it also to other people who never had the, the luck to be part of Hermes. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dirk, for those remarks. So uh, just calling on Moskov, Marian, please. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to see all of you. I don't see myself, but okay, that's fine. Oh, we see you, we see you. Okay. <clears throat> so Hermes was a great experiment, first of all. And people who like Richard and Klaus Witt, who initiated this proposal, were every one of us are very thankful. So the idea of the Hermes at, at the beginning was sort of G1, and E prime, but then it was a large uh, spectrometer which you can detect final states. And I was always talking about the final states and one day even Wagner invited me to his office and said, stop talking about final states. You are designed to make G1 measurement. That's it, you have to do that. And I said, how do you know <laughs> what will come out from this experiment? And it appears that the most Highest impact of Hermes was not on E prime. Highest impact was on, on a semi-inclusive DVCS and uh, other stuff. So now I remember when uh, G published a paper 1996 of DVCS, we were trying, I was trying to understand how we can measure that. I called him, I called Tradushkin, and they said, we have no idea. Tradushkin bold it said, my, my task is a theory. How you do that, it's your problem. And finally, we understood that this interference may be used, and we did it. And in fact, as Richard mentioned, uh, the new collider, which is uh, in the process of being built in Brookhaven, has a few flagship uh, physics motivations for that. And one of them is exactly the, uh, the 3D, like GPDs, and John Donk mentioned that. And I'm proud that our work uh, become uh, such a, a sort of flagship for, look, we published a paper on 19, uh, uh, or 2000, I, I reported in, in 2000, and then we had a workshop at DAISY, and then we had a spin uh, conference in Osaka and we did it first and then it becomes uh, 
uh, JLab is measuring this for 20 years now, and will continue to measure for another 10 years at least. And then the <coughs> collider, which will be built, as you said, in uh, and start at 90, beginning of uh, 2030s, will go, will run for another 15 or 20 years or something like that. Which means we have an impact on our field for half a century. And I'm really proud of that. And uh, I think everyone is proud of that. And I enjoy the time being at Hermes and all support which I got from, from my colleagues around the world, from, uh, from Nikev, uh, from Daisy, and I should mention Rome, Italy, Fulani, and his group, they were very, very helpful. And you know, uh, there's so many people I remember uh, who are not seeing each other every day, but you are always in my memory. I love you all. And the book is uh, excellent. And uh, I think it is very good, very good book. I bought it immediately and I read it. I don't know if it could be <clears throat> revised or not, but there's some few minor comments, but maybe, <laughs> I don't know if it will be second edition or not. Uh, that's all. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I think that every one of Hermes people should be proud of such a successful experiment, which was not local and not finished by the time it finished. In 2007, we stopped data taking, but it doesn't mean that Hermes stopped and it continues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Moskov. Um, I see Mike Vetterly on. Mike, did you want to make some comments? Sure. Hi, everyone. That's great. Hey. Oh, too bad the cameras were off. But from what I saw, you know, this experiment used to be young people. That's the one thing that I remember about it most is how quickly we got everything done and the amount of effort that was put in a lot by the young people. I remember doing things that it was better that the lab didn't know about, like sleeping in the East Hall, which we weren't supposed to do. And um, Earhart mentioned the polarimeter, which was a, almost a whole experiment in itself that we had to do before we even got approved. And what I remember about Hermes is is the amount of effort that people put in and uh, you know that that everybody really loved it and and was really dedicated to the experiment you know i've gone on to work on atlas which has three thousand people in it and you know while the discoveries we made on atlas are made probably more impact than hermes hermes is still to me the highlight of my career because um everybody had had uh, their their role to play and and contributed. I remember once sitting down with Yo uh, when we were under time pressure and uh, trying to figure out you know how we could get more people to work on Hermes. And we went through the collaboration list, and ninety percent of the people were actually working hard on the experiment. It's just that the amount of work that had to get done was was so big that we were under constant pressure and and everyone stepped up so that's what i remember about hermes is the the dedication of an awful lot of people who had a common goal and and we all had fun with uh, with the physics so thank you for uh you know publishing the book and reminding us all of what what that was like i mean like i said you know to me hermes is still the most fun i ever had uh as a physicist so nice this we should probably turn all the cameras on at the end so we can all see each other. Uh, I know bandwidth is a problem, but we should probably do that at the end of the, of the Zoom call. Great idea. Great idea. Thanks, Mike. Um, I see Je uh, Jeff Court. Is Jeff Court on? Yeah. Jeff, did you want to make any comments? I guess. Um, oh. Well, I, uh, I was probably, I wasn't among this um, uh, younger math. In fact, I was, I didn't quite hold the record age, but I was certainly one of the more senior people and was sort of parachuted in 
um, to, um, to help with the technology, um, which was quite fascinating, actually. The, the, that in itself, um, independent of the, of, of the physics, getting that, that te technology to work was, oh, to me, one of the most interesting things I've, I've done in the whole, whole world of physics. And also, um, the, the atmosphere of the experiment was great. Um, compared, I mean, I had an experience of quite a lot of experiments, but compared with CERN and um, other places, there was a, a very good feeling, particularly between the machine, I mean, the advantage of the polarized beam, there was a huge interaction of, uh, between the machine people and uh, um, the experiment, which also, I mean, the machine was not, not just providing a service. It was, I can remember many, many evening sessions in the control room talking to um, the people about the polarization, trying to um, optimize the the beam polarization. Um, it was it, it was a wonderful atmosphere, so so cooperative. It's quite quite different from many other experiments I've I've been involved with. Okay, great. Well. Great to see you and thank you for those remarks. Um, just changing a little bit, I, I see Ferdinand Villica is on and he was, uh, as we described in the book, he was the maestro of uh, Hera. Uh, so I don't know if Ferdinand, if you uh, want to make remarks or say anything, please. Okay, so <laughs> good, uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning. So thank you very much for, um, remembering uh, the machine people <laughs> who, who <laughs> provide the beams for your experiment. I'm, I'm very uh, glad to see that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the efforts in integrating Hermes into the HERA operations uh, uh, resulted in such a marvelous physics results. And, and I think the, I see from your comments that uh, from the comments of the people that uh, these uh, times are well remembered and uh, and I, I always see Hermes results um, uh, quoted in my new working environment which is the electron ion collider so I think it's uh, it it uh, uh, I think I feel very satisfied of having been uh, ahead of my, my modest chair of uh, of contributing to to uh, the, the results of this experiment. So congratulations. Uh, I haven't read the book. <laughs> I hope I will have, uh, get, hand, get my hands on a copy. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, happy to see you all and uh, happy to see that you all have very good memories at, uh, at, uh, uh, on this uh, experiment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see Caroline. Riedel, Carol, Carol, would you like to make some comments? Sure. Um, so I, I was a, a grad student at Hermes. I um, defended my PhD in 2005. And um, I, I still think back to Hermes, uh, missing it incredibly. So this, uh, I think, was also the best time of my life. I stayed with Hermes for uh, some more time. So I lived in Hamburg until 2012. And then I moved on to uh, Compass um, at CERN and then later to um, S Phoenix at Brookhaven National Lab. And I'm now in uh, Champaign-Urbana. Um, and uh, uh, the, the, the Hermes physics that, that has been um, yeah, um, carried out um, was always uh, um, yeah, 
it's 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 great to remember it, and um, we 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 continue building on it. So uh, yeah, yeah, what 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 whatever we work on now. And um, but one thing I wanted to point out uh, was the the specialty um, working at Hermes were the people, and I think this has been mentioned by several um, of the speakers today that. Um, the, that the um, unique feature of the Hermes collaboration was uh, how people work together. We all moved in one direction. Um, it was just a collaboration of a size that you can know everyone, you know um, everyone's face, at least uh, at, at, at the time you were there. And uh, this is certainly not the case anymore with the larger collaborations that many of us are working in nowadays. And. And uh, Ed also mentioned the Thursday evenings out, the offsite meetings that we continued, I think, until at least uh, 2010 or 11. So that was a highlight. Yeah, I, I will never forget Hermes. And I uh, maybe one day we can uh, all meet together again for a seminar and for the, I don't know, 20th anniversary of end of data taking in 2007. And thank you very much for writing the book, uh, Richard and, and Erhard. Thanks, Caroline. Um, I see Andreas Schaefer. Andreas, did you want to make some comments? Yeah, I can say some a few words. I mean, no. Do you see me? Yes. No. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm a kind of uh, exception in Hermes because I was a member of the collaboration. Still am, I think. But uh, I'm a theoretician. Always was. I was a young theoretician. I all started. Uh, and that was really, like for everybody else, a thing which determined what I did in the, my further uh, academic life. Because at Hermes, I really learned to cherish experiments. Yeah? We have very many theoreticians, especially in this more formal stuff I typically work on, who, I don't know, yeah, think that data points come for free, fall down from the heavens. And uh, that I understood is really different. And I always enjoyed and still enjoy a lot to speak with experimentalists because they really pose those questions which really concern physics and uh, which you should concentrate on rather than doing whatever, yeah, some higher order calculation of something and stuff. Yeah? So I, I greatly enjoyed it. I profited a lot. It's not so clear to me how much Hermes profited for me, but at least for me, that was an extremely valuable element of my early career. Great. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, Marcus Diefenthaler, would you like to make some comments, please? Yeah, thank you. Um, congratulations on this uh, exciting book. Um, which like you heard in the previous comments really um, also brought me back to a really um, excellent time in, in life. Um, I'm currently working mostly on the electron ion collider. And when I think about EIC science, then I think about Hermes science, but now this time as, as a collider experiment. And there's a really, also Ferdinand mentioned this uh, before, there's this very strong connection between um, what we pioneered at Hermes and what is now done at this um, new upcoming frontier accelerator facility. Um, you all mentioned how much fun it was at, at Hermes. I, I can only um, echo that. And, and to me, some of the things which were unique about that compared to other experiments was Hermes had an excellent structure. And this structure really also encouraged, it gave younger people um, sp space to actually contribute to the experiment. And I think it was also pioneering in the role of, of diversity and inclusion, thinking, for instance, about um, how many um, female scientists have been in um, uh, management roles at, at, at Hermes over the, the period of, of, of the experiment. Um, the other thing I think was, was really unique about Hermes was simply the critical mass of talent which was combined there. And this was also mentioned by many before, that we all have been friends and, and we enjoyed going out with each other and not only exploring the inner structure of, um, of Hermes, but also exploring the outer structure uh, of, of, of Daisy um, and exploring, exploring the, the nightlife of, of, of Hamburg. Um, 
the what, what I like about the book is it, it's also a reminder about what a long journey it is to, to build an experiment from the first idea, making the experiment work, funding wise, building it, running the experiment, and then getting exciting analysis results out. And this is a reminder, I think, for everyone who is now working on the electron ion collider. We are excited that this project is going forward, but it will be a lot of work and it will be a lot of time to, to make it work, um, to build it. Uh, to, to run it and, and uh, hopefully a lot of the lessons, I think what we learned at, at, at Hermes um, from a management point of view, from a personal point of view, and of course, from a scientific point of view will play an important role in, in the electron ion collider. And I think this, this book is just a really, um, has a lot of anecdotes with that, but also has a lot of lessons in there. So thank you very much. Thanks, Marcus. Uh, I see Jim Kelsey, Jim, did you? Want to make some comments? Sure. Um, yeah, no, that was, I mean, that was the first large experiment I worked on and uh, really launched what's been a really fruitful and interesting career for me. Um, the one personal story I'll relate is I remember when we were in the meeting to decide whether hydrogen or helium was going to run first. And the hydrogen people said they it was going to take them two years to be ready. And you, you know, then they went to you and you went through your presentation and said, we can be ready in a year. And we walked out of that meeting and you looked at me and you said quietly, can we do it? <laughs> and the rest is history. We were able to do it. I mean, it was a quite an effort, but uh, it was it was a great environment to be in. I love Hamburg. I've loved all the time I've spent at Daisy. Um, it's just been fantastic. And the people I've met, I mean, the physics community is a pretty small community. And, you know, right here, you can see all the people that are here. Um, I've worked with several of these people on other experiments. And it's been, you know, thank you. Thank you for writing the book. Um, and uh, just thank you for what's been a very great, interesting and fruitful career. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Wolfgang Korsch. Please. Oh, hi. Yep. Hi, Richard. Hi, Eric. Thanks for writing this book. It's certainly great. I'm looking forward to reading it. And yeah, certainly I'm all, I have been fond of Hermes. It was just great. I learned so much, met so many good people. And basically, the reason why I'm here is thanks to Hermes. I mean, really, uh, it gave me a lot. And it's interesting. I, I, it's, I'm not sure, but I might be the very first graduate student on Hermes. Because I, I joined the MPI and um, Erhard's group as a diploma student. And we were in the process of developing an internal target for Filtex. It was just a new idea that came up. And I remember at the MPI, there was a, a coffee table and coffee, you could get coffee in the afternoons. We often sat together, a few of us, discussed some, some issues, problems that we had. And one afternoon, um, um, Klaus Ried joined us and said, so you're developing this, this internal target uh, for, for, the, uh, for actually um, the low energy ring, anti-proton ring Lear at, at uh, CERN. And would that also work in an electron ring? And well, I mean, that was there, we were thinking, and we didn't have a reason why it shouldn't. And that was just when the NMC collaboration found their, their started their proton spin measurements and had first results. And, so sort if of we thought about this a little bit and then basically from that day on, the whole effort changed from, from um, the, the Lear effort, Filtex effort to the Hermes effort. And yeah, we worked on the development of the hydrogen source and the target. And it was great to get it installed, see how it's working with really happily and many other great people, physicists. I learned so much there. And I really appreciate that, that you and, and Erhard took the effort to write that book. And, it's a nice documentation how, how things evolved, how it was, and it's a great inspiration for young physicists. And many of us are still in physics because of that experiment. So thank you very much. Thanks, Wolfgang. Uh, Mark Beckman, did you want to say something? Please. Sure. Thank you very much for inviting me, for calling me, uh, as I'm one of the guys who chose 18 years back to leave science and to move on to industry. 
Uh, and because of that, of course, I'm, I'm not dealing with the spin structure immediately <laughs> any longer. But it is amazing, first of all, to that feeling which is still there to, to see and listen to you. That is an amazing feeling, like it still feels like coming home. And secondly, also in hindsight, there's still a lot of things I can apply in my, in my now different position in industry. Now I'm in the medical device industry. I'm now building or helping to design angiography systems. And that is coordinating a development force of roughly 500 people uh, in a global setup. And uh, it is amazing to see how many of the principles, which many of you already mentioned, uh, we, we still apply, even though we call them differently now. Now we use terms like agile development, lean methodologies. But, but if, you, if you really dig deep and understand the root causes, many of the things which many of you mentioned, like it's the, it's the, the very good personal connection you have, it's the it's the joint, uh, you, you work towards a common goal and, and that really brings together an enormously powerful team. And this is what we still try to apply. So thank you very much for having me, for inviting me. And it's always a pleasure to see and uh, listen to many of you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Pasquale, Ineza, did you want to make a comment, please? Hi, hello, yes. Good afternoon, everybody. So it's really a pleasure to be here. But uh, let me talk about the future of Hermes. <laughs> uh, I'm not kidding. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Uh, but uh, maybe somebody of you uh, knows that uh, uh, we are uh, installing the uh, Hermes technology, uh, the, the, the one that we use for that target, at the Large Hadron Collider, a CERN, uh, using the LACB spectrometer that is really a, a super Hermes. If you see the detector is really Hermes, uh, of course, 20 years later. Uh, and um, a group of uh, uh, former Hermes members that I have the honor and privilege to, to lead, uh, including uh, Herod, um, is installing this uh, target at LACB. Uh, we have already installed the, the unpolarized storage cell. It really uh, lo looks like the Hermes one, a little bit more complicated, but it's that one. And uh, we are uh, starting the unpolarized physics with this uh, fantastic uh, collider in uh, next year, basically. And we are studying the uh, polarized uh, target cell, really starting from the ABS, BRP, you know, all these things that in Hermes were uh, so recurrent. Uh, and then uh, we are bringing the polarization, the polarized physics, uh, uh, the LAC. The so uh, really, the, for at least for me, for a group of uh, uh, friends, uh, the Hermes um, story uh, doesn't end. Uh, we really continue to, to carry on our flag. <laughs> Great. Thank you. I see Wolf Dieter. Wolf Dieter Novak, please. Hello, everybody. Um, it's not so easy to say something after all these interesting words we have heard in the last hour. Um, that's the hi Richard, hi Erhard. Uh, I, I hope um, that I can uh, bring something new. This is especially, let me call it, cultural aspect of, of Hermes. Uh, Hermes was, was uh, conceived uh, exactly, basically, uh, the year when the German unification was taking place. Uh, so Mr. Gorbachev uh, changed the world at that time. Uh, he finally uh, allowed the US and Soviet Union physicists to sort of unify on, on a large geographic scale. And this was seen in Hermes. We have American groups, we have uh, Russian groups. And on the small scale, if you like, uh, something similar happened uh, between Western and Eastern Germany. Uh, Zeuthen, this is the institute, former institute of high energy physics uh, of the former Academy of Science of East Germany. Uh, was asked to uh, collaborate with um, this DAISY already for the unification as a sort of one of five big topics that led to the scientific uh, unification of two Germanys. And um, there was a H1 group, there was a ZUS, and after all, there was a Hermes group formed in the 
new part of DAISY, Zeuthen, in 1992, which was, as we have heard, exactly the moment when, when uh, Hermes really became into, into action. And I had a pleasure to, to be there from the very beginning. I was uh, uh, still some, somewhat uh, younger. Later on, I managed to, uh, to, to lead the, the DAISY group of, of, uh, of Hermes. Uh, with many uh, very talented colleagues. We had uh, young people, we had uh, more experienced people. Some of them I miss really today in our, in our meeting, like, like Jim Stewart, Erika Aschenauer. And I do also miss uh, Klaus Ried. I haven't heard about him anything. I, I hope he is still well. Other, other names I would have loved to, to have uh, also here in this conference today, but I'm happy to see all of you. And uh, this was uh, my, my main point to say Hermes had uh, not only scientific impact, not only personal impact, it had also a cultural impact. Uh, for me, this is a, a really very important thing. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very interesting point you make. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Lara, Leonardo, would you like to make a comment? Hi, <laughs> uh, it's very nice to see all of you. I haven't seen many of you in so long. I was thinking about what um, Hermes did for me. And um, even though I left science, I have to say that uh, one thing that um, really helped me is, uh, for example, writing articles or making presentations the extreme care that was <laughs> that went into every single word, and I want to thank Wolf Dieter and Klaus Ried especially with that. And uh, so after that, I cannot read any article anywhere <laughs> without thinking how sloppy it is. And uh, also, yes, the amount of work that went into presentations, the same thing, how everything has to be very precise and um, and well organized, and uh, how many times we tried and tried to make everything really perfect. And I think these are skills that stay with you anywhere. <laughs> so thank you, Hermes, for that. <laughs> Great, thanks, Lara. Um, I see Horst Fisher. Horst, did you want to make some comments, please? Uh, you're muted, Horst. Yeah, no, it should be unmuted. Yeah. Uh, hi, Richard. Hi, Erhard. Yeah, really nice to see so many former Hermes colleagues. Yeah, I joined Hermes in 95 when the first beam was to be arriving to be experiment. And uh, we set up at that time the second polarimeter uh, for the experiment, the longitudinal polarimeter which was supposed to measure polarization right at the experiment yeah, and not in, on the other side of the art. And it was really fun and uh, I enjoyed the time with Hermes very much. Yeah. Working with all these colleagues in Hamburg was a very different experience for me. I just came from the States at that time from Brookhaven and uh, moved to Hamburg and uh, so it was special time and I would also emphasize the strong support we always received from DC yeah this is an experience I never had afterwards when I left uh, Hermes uh, the having the funding agency right in the same lab simplified life for all the German universities participating in the experiment. Yeah? So, and it was the time when Richard was spokesperson at that time when I was at Hermes. And uh, for me, it was also a different experience to see somebody such structured and uh, such uh, focused on the success of the experiment. So thank you, uh, Richard, very much for that experience you gave us. Uh, so I'm pleased to read that book. Yeah, I haven't received a copy yet. Yeah, so I hope it will arrive in the next days, and uh, it will be the perfect literature for uh, vacation time, I suppose. Yeah, thanks, Erhard.
Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Horst. Um, I think we're over time, but is there anybody else who would like to make some comments? Uh, please, you're welcome to, to join in or ask. Or... Also, Dr. Mueller, there was a question that was submitted, so maybe you can comment on that. It's, uh, it's from Margaret. She loved the cover. She would like to know how did the cover come from? Um, yeah, the cover was um, created by uh, David Milner, uh, who's a designer, uh, and um, really um, the integration of the data from the front to the spine to the back was, was rather unique. So the picture uh, is very eye-catching as, as came, I think it was Earhart, it came from the polarized uh, internal target. And so um, that was the that was the origin of the cover. And here's a, a question for Dr. Stephens. Uh, can you elaborate on the early history of polarized gas targets? Yes, with great pleasure. So um, the gas target we are using are uh, not high pressure targets, but very thin targets, which can uh, run in, uh, together with a, store, a beam in a storage ring. The, the first idea uh, of this uh, pure gas targets of, of low thickness came from our colleague Willy Heberly. In 1965, he proposed at a uh, meeting in Karlsruhe, Germany, he proposed to use a kind of uh, Teflon coated storage bulb to store polarized gas and use it uh, for a scattering experiment. Uh, but, and this was uh, somehow uh, I think the model or the idea came from the uh, hydrogen maser, where such a storage bulb is used uh, to, to store polarized hydrogen gas for uh, spin resonance uh, experiments, and uh, especially to, to use it for as a frequency normal. Okay, and then uh, nobody took up this proposal and then uh, 15 years later, Willy assembled a group of students and they built a test experiment and found out that this really worked. They, uh, they could store uh, polarized gas in a storage bulb uh, with uh, where all these the atoms did in in average about 1000 wall collisions without changing the, the polarization. And this was a real, the, the proof that one could use this idea. And then uh, uh, we, it went on to optimize storage uh, cells. So one of the first experiments with hydrogen was done in Heidelberg uh, at the test storage ring, which then uh, somehow uh, convinced us this, that this is a technology useful for other storage rings like the antiproton storage ring at, at CERN or the electron storage ring at DAISY. So this is the, the, uh, the main history of, of these targets which we are using. Thank you. Thank you. We have now come to the end of today's event. Thank you, Dr. Muner and Dr. Stephens. Uh, we encourage everyone to give this book a read and we're offering a 25% discount to today's attendees. I think someone suggests to turn on the camera so everyone can have a little casual chat. So please feel free to do so for the next few minutes. Right. Thank you, everyone. Okay. And someone suggests a group photo.